Neuro degeneration. We uh, ran part of this um, uh, conversation last week, I mean uh, on Wednesday, and so we are continuing today, but I'm using a different, uh, I'm using, I made 10 copies. So, so pay attention to me and not to the notes, if not the notes will not make sense. So did we have 10 copies? I made 10 copies and then make some extra ones since we have a so neurodegeneration tell us Simon what is neurodegeneration it's the degradation of neurons wow <laughs> neuro degeneration and what causes neurodegeneration? Not just one thing. There's one big one. Wi-Fi. There's one big one. No, it's neuro inflammation. And where does neuroinflammation comes from? That's the big conversation. What is what is inflammation? Why does do, did God? I'm assuming, right? We're all God connected. Created this architecture and gave us inflammation. What is the need for? Why do we need inflammation, Victor? To make us aware that we have a problem going on. <laughs> Good. Signal. Actually, yeah, it's a signal of what is going on, of what? Uh, infection. Contamination. Yeah, it's a signal that something is wrong. So it's a good reaction. When, when does it become a bad thing? Oh, yes. You're too smart. <laughs> no, no. Now I want to understand what is chronic. What does chronic mean? You know, because you know, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, why is it repetitive? So let's look at, let's look at the flow chart for inflammation. So there is a stimulus and there is a response. What is the stimulus and what is the response? Now I'm teaching you scientific process. The stimulus is one of those things, right? And inflammation is the response. So this is typically how it would look like. There's the inflammation and there's the modulation of the inflammation. Right? You get a cut, it gets inflamed, then it gets healed. Right? And the inflammatory agents are because we get all the agents that are coming to repair and fight off the potential infection in that side. Right? Then it heals. Then it goes away. That's the normal rep response, right? The, what uh, Rick was talking about, chronic inflammation, is the lack of this modulation. So it goes inflamed and stays inflamed. Why does it stay inflamed? It's the big question. Why does it stay inflamed? It's not healing. Yeah, why is it not healing? Because no. it's not working. No, 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 no. It is healing. This is the healing. This is the modulation. Oh, the modulation. Why is it not working? It's still continuous aggravation. Correct. That's the issue. There's continuous aggregation. So within this profile, there is this. You see that? So there is modulation happening, but because the inflammation or the irritation is persistent, the response stays at that level. And when that persists, we get chronic inflammation, which is what is bad because of the chronicity, not because of the inflammation. Is that making sense, guys? It's the chronicity that is the problem, it's not the inflammation. So the body's regenerating system uh, stops working 
No, you're going further than where I, I oh, am. Okay. Stay with me. So, because now you're going to something that we discussed on Wednesday, which I was going to get to. So, now the body is being asked for a lot of resources, what we call physiological resilience and the metabolic reserve, to keep damping out this. It uses a lot of resources, right? Like what? Like what? What kinds of resources are required to modulate inflammation? vitamins, amino acids, fats. We have to repair the cell. We have to create new cells, right? We have to reprogram. We have to build immune cells because they've been destroyed in the fight. So the body requires more resources, right? And if we're not giving those resources, what does the body start doing? Goes to um, Simone's favorite topic, the epigenetic effects. So as the body is responding, and it's short of resources, what does it start doing? It does what human beings do. What do they do when they're out of resources and they need to cope with stress? Exactly. They take shortcuts. That is the epigenetic outcomes. The body says, how do we create new cells without enough nutrients? They take shortcuts. Hmm? They steal. <laughs> they borrow from this pocket to this pocket. What happens when you do that kind of borrowing? <laughs> yes. You have the epigenetic issues. That's where methylation and all of that comes in. That's the actually at the core of methylation. So to stay healthy, you have to keep providing the things that the body needs to keep supporting this persistent inflammation. Why can we not get rid of all inflammation? Jad, why is it not possible to get rid of all inflammation? Because we don't have enough power to regenerate. That's not true. That's not correct. Just your normal response. So, why can we not get rid of all that response? environment we live in a toxic environment right yeah except there are some kids we've tried to put in a bubble right so we live in the ecosystem there are challenges in that ecosystem and everything else you know I was listening on the radio this morning and hold on I was listening on the radio this morning and somebody um, uh, these two men went to Africa and did a surrender uh, Seren Seren Serengeti a movie about watching animals and he said one of the things that was really shocking to him he got attached to some animals and he realized that he wanted them to win and they're carnivores right this alliance and they have to kill other animals to eat and he started realizing he didn't care about those other animals who were being killed he was he was taking sides already as nature plays itself out you know in our culture where we got close to animals and we don't realize that these animals have to eat other animals to survive. Yeah. That's the way life works, right? Somebody has to die for us to live, right? Chicken have to die, cows have to die so that we can survive, right? So if you get emotionally attached to the cows and the chicken, then what happens to us, right? Victor, what was your question? It, it, it sounded like the inflammation is part of what is necessary for our evolution. Correct. Yeah. No, 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 no. You're jumping to evolution for our survival. Okay. It's necessary for our survival. Inflammation is our response. Why, what do we call it? We call it a fight or flight response. So inflammation is critical for our survival and for our copying, right, of building the long-term survival of that architecture. Is that making sense? All right, so let's walk back because I took a jump and started talking about neuroinflammation. But where does neuroinflammation come from? That's where we're now talking about the 
gut brain barrier neuroinflammation so let's go to your notes we're gonna go back and front on your notes so let's go to the second page in your notes that picture so I just wanted to show you the brain architecture um, a pair, pair doesn't have a copy come on guys come on I don't need to be taking care of this So I don't know the three of you are back there you need to pay attention to the audience right whether people are comfortable or not okay so um, so look at that picture I wanted to show you the architecture of the brain you know the brain has a lot of blood vessels not in the brain but permeating the architecture of the brain so that blood brain barrier is a very sacrosanct barrier because only fats are in the brain and the brain architecture is made of of those brain cells the neurons and I wanted to show you the really important issue which is the myelin sheath in neuroinflammation those sheets are destroyed and when they are destroyed the brain cell dies so when you see pictures of people who have Alzheimer's or Parkinson's you see dark spots where these cells have died and they've died because that persistent inflammation destroys what we call the myelination destroys the myelin sheets which is what protects the brain cells and, and manages uh, what they do is that they optimize the signal strength right because it's energy that's how the brain runs right there's electrical energy that runs it's like the electrical wire you see on the street it needs that cover to reduce the frictional energy that is being dispersed as it is the electrical energy is running so it needs that sheet that's what that sheet does so once that sheet is removed from the neuron it exposes it and the overall brain cell dies that's what neuroinflammation causes and that's why areas of the brain die and there are no signals there anymore is that very clear so that's what then leads to different spectral illnesses in neurodegeneration whether it's Parkinson's, whether it's Alzheimer's, whether it's autism, whether it's ADHD, and a whole spectrum of different things that show up. Okay? Yes, question, Jack. Can we put down these signals to not make the brain overreact or over function? Well, that's the point of what. Because why I'm saying this? Yeah. Because I have read things that I have. Okay, Jad. Okay, Jad. But you know, you you have a genetic issue, yes. right? And so that's one of when we talk about it's actually on the first page on the causes of disease is that one of them is genetic, and therefore that genetic instruction went and created extra blood vessels. But the extra blood vessels are not the cause of inflammation. The extra blood vessels are just carrying more supply to the brain so you should be smarter because you have more nutrients going to your brain so but if now let's go to the big question where is that underlying inflammation coming from that underlying inflammation is coming let's go to our next page so you see this picture that I drew okay. so where does inflammation so at the top inflammation creates this set of response chemicals called cytokines these cytokines also go to the brain i want you to be on this page this page okay don't go ahead and then get lost 
okay? Like in the forest, they teach us, right? Oh, she, he didn't grow up in the forest. In the forest, you follow the line. When you step out of the line, you get eaten. <laughs> so that's why I'm very disciplined about stuff. You follow the line. From when you're a little boy, they teach you that. You follow the line. You step out of line, you get eaten. Okay, so stay with me. So we have all these issues going on. I'm not going to get you done. But it leads to this thing we call brain inflammation. Right? It is really the body trying to respond and fix what's going on at the source of inflammation. So who's going to get this answer? Where is the biggest source of inflammation response in our bodies? Kim? The gut. Why is it always that? No, no, that's not why. That's not why. Why is it, Victor? Why is the gut the biggest source of inflammation? Because of all the, the germs inside, the, the germs and the bad germs. No, that's not why. Tell us. Micronutrients are garbage. What the heck? The bullshit, right? A lot of crap is coming in and the body is in heightened inflammation all the time because you don't eat good clean food or clean water. You get that? So that's where the big issue is. And so the body is reacting and it's in chronic inflammation and it's sending these signals. And we're going to see on the next chart when it breaks the tight junctions, then all the germs and toxins flow into the bloodstream. And because Jad has a lot of blood vessels in the brain, more of them are getting to the brain. I know that, but that's sad. You're not listening, Jad. Because you have more blood vessels, it means there is more inflammatory materials coming to your brain. And that's why they need to reduce it. And therefore, it goes right back to the gut, right? So let's go to the next page and look at that. So I wanted to show you in a lot of detail and this is from they call it mechanisms of disease. I know you can read that in a lot of detail but the next chart on Zonolini is going to take us there so let's just stay here. So indigestible fragments of gluten induce gastrocytes to release the protein zonulin which loosens tight junctions. See the gluten problem? Indigestible gluten. Our body doesn't know what to do with gluten. Causes this problem that leads to the release of the protein zonulin which loosens tight junctions. That is really at the fundamental level. And not just, I'm just using one gluten, the other things that cause zonulin to be released, right? Most of us eat McDonald's, we don't actually know what's in the meat. And so all those indigestible compounds, when they're in the stomach, the stomach wants to digest them. And it releases zonulin for that process. And that thing op opens up our tight junctions, okay? It goes into a lot of detail you cannot read, so let's look at the next chart that gives us a much clearer picture of zonulin. Right? For some of you who attend class, you've seen this before. The connection between leaky gut and leaky brain. So every time people think that because we are talking about neurodegeneration, we're going to be talking about the brain. We have to go to the source of neuroinflammation which is at the source of inflammation, which is the gut. Because if you want to fix that problem, that's where you need to go fix, right? And then, when you fix that problem, what happens? Then the body systems themselves will begin to clear all the residual matter that had accumulated. And potentially, because the brain has plasticity, the brain will build new cells, right? And potentially perhaps repair the old ones, right? Because our stem cells will be deployed. And then some of the memory might come back. 
but there's no guarantee that all the memory would come back because it would repair regenerate and build new cells is that making sense so now let's deal with this boy called Zenoli it's a bad boy okay so the discovery began with a failed attempt to develop a cholera vaccine. Zonolin is really something that's inside our body. And I know the notes are not very clear, the copy is not very clear. But it, it goes through like a five-step process, right? We have what we call zonolin release, right? And then the immune response to the development of a leaky gut. And that's why sometimes I don't even want to test for leaky gut because everybody has it. So it's like saying, oh, I confirm that you're white. Oh, I confirm that you're black. Okay, I know that shit already. Everybody has leaky gut. Why? Because we suffer from eating a lot of stuff that's not digestible and therefore leads to that, right? So yes, we can do confirmatory testing to check but some people cannot afford it. So doing that testing sometimes is not necessary or perhaps necessary just to create the baseline. But the question is, if you have resources, where do you want to deploy the resources, right? As we begin to treat you over time to find out, right? So what is more important? Everybody loves measurement, but what's more important is actually doing the work yeah. rather than the measurement. Because sometimes measurement is distracting. Why can measurement be distracting? That's one. Secondly, measurements are wrong. They can be wrong. Yeah. Because we're using technology to measure. We have false positives and false negatives. So measurement can be wrong. So when Exactly. Well, exactly. Who can afford to be measuring that that often? And so that's the challenge because we just have confidence in measurement, like blood pressure. Every time you take your blood pressure, it's different. And it's not just your blood pressure, it's the machine itself. The repeatability of measures. And that's what a lot of people who don't understand science or technology don't get. Measurement is a relative issue. So you cannot lock yourself into the number. That number is a relative measurement. Are we clear about this stuff? So there is deep systemic error in measurement itself. So what is more important is that you're doing the right things. And hopefully, right, the point statistic will turn into a trend. So now, now let me teach you some statistics, right? So the first measurement doesn't say anything whether it's good or bad or whatever. The second measurement begins to create what we call a trend, right? It's going up, it's staying the same, it's coming down. But in statistics, we need three because the three is gonna give us a sense of what's really going on. So if the third measure was here, right, and this was your measurement, then you see we're beginning to see that it is actually increasing, right? Or if this was your measurement, you see now we're beginning to see a story, right? And if this was your measurement. So in statistics and measurement, we need three measures to begin to give us a sense of what's going on. Do you get that? So this point itself doesn't tell you anything. It is just what it is. It's where you go. No, it's where, where you, you are. are. No, it's just where you are first and then when you, when you go. Well, no, but no, so stay with me. It is just telling you where you are. But where you are doesn't mean a lot because you are an individual. So we need the second and third measurements to know where you are going and what's really going on. That's what I mean. Yes. Where you are, yeah. The next two is is that important, your... guys? Because everybody's blood pressure is different from everybody else. Okay? So generally we say at 140 is hypertension. 
but for you it might not be. Do you understand that? It's very important that we understand the global measurements and your personalized measurements. So how do we know that if I'm at 140, I'm not hypertension? That, you said the that's why over time, that's what I'm teaching you, over time, where is that measure staying? And secondly, are you showing the outcomes of being hypertensive? what you're really saying is when you go to a doctor and they say 140 they put you on medication yeah it might not necessarily correct be where is, correct you need medication correct because for some of us so let's look at the point of hypertension right this is 140 for some of us at 160 is when we're hypertensive and for some of us at 120 is where we're hypertensive Everybody's a distribution. All they've given you is a mean of that distribution as the hypertensive point. There are people who at 120 are hypertensive, and there are people who it's at 160 that they get hypertensive. You need to really understand statistics and measurement and the data that we, the, and your body. So for you as the individual, we want to look at these measuring points and actually understand what's going on with the measurement. Is, is that clear? We need to do that. Okay? D are we clear about that? So, that's why, even if we're measuring leaky guard, it doesn't really mean a lot. The first measurement. What is important is that everybody has leaky guard. What is important is the focus on fixing leaky guard rather than the focus on the measurement. Same thing with high blood pressure. You need to focus on reducing stress you need to focus on doing those lifestyle things that we're doing because those things are very, very important. Is that clear? Okay. So let's look at the next steps of Zonolin. So these stressors that Zonolin releases and our immune system releases, they enter the circulation. That's in that diagram, the cytokines. Those are the things that then go to the brain and then the blood-brain barrier causes that dysfunction, right? Because it also then goes and opens up, because this tight junction that is also at the blood-brain barrier is a one cell structure. It is made that thin and permeable so that all the nutrients can go into the brain without the blood going, right? Because it's a one cell structure and it's very thin, the red blood cells cannot go in, but the lymphocytes can go in, right? Because it's the lymphocytes that are the immune system that fight illness, right? And so that's why in Alzheimer's and the accumulation of amyloid is that it's actually an inflammation response that's accumulating based on the attack, whether it's a bacterial attack or whatever that is coming through the blood-brain barrier. <clears throat> That's why every day the brain is depositing that and then causing real not blackness and overwhelming the ability for the neural architecture to function. Is that making sense? Are we all clear about that? Okay. Any questions? All right. So when we look at, let's go to the next page, now we start doing some tough work. Now I'll go to the first page and then come back to this page. Let's go back to our first page. So typically, when a patient comes, we're asking two questions. When a customer, because we're all patients, nobody's well. My mother used to say that the world is like the emergency room of a hospital. We are all in different stages of illness, right? And so everyone is ill. No one has perfect health, except you just ran the marathon yesterday. Even so, you have a lot of inflammation issues in your body because you just ran the marathon, right? You need the recovery. So the question is, the first question is, and this is how we've built our intervention model here. Does this person need to be rid of something such as toxins, allergy, infection, poor diet, or stress? And these things are what are the lower, the, what we call the causes, the overall causes of illness. Do you need a blanket or something? Can you get one? 
and then the second question does this person have some unmet individual need that must be filled for optimal function and so we're going to talk about some of these things right so let's look at the causes and then let's look at how our biological systems need to respond so we have seven biological systems where our imbalances show up and I'll just capture them at a very high level so we have number one our cardiometabolic number two our immune system uh, number three we have our stress response system number four we have everything okay yeah. oh okay number four we have what prasant <laughs> Well, tell me. So we have cardiometabolic, we have the immune system, we have um, that uh, the stress response system, we have um, what? Yeah, we have the musculoskeletal system, and go further. These systems, when there is an imbalance right we know where the imbalances are coming from those five things stress toxicity genetic risk um, nutrient deficiency and infections these things cause an imbalance in our biological systems the challenge with current western medicine is that it tries to find out did stress cause something in the cardiometabolic that's not how the body works. When the body is stressed, there is a homeostatic response across all the full biological system to compensate for that stress issue. And therefore, when we pinpoint only one area to fix, we are missing the response that the other biological systems had attenuated what's attenuation they are responding to this change in the overall environment right now you're stressed the whole system wants to stay alert because you're stressed so everything is working harder right and so if you want to then address you have to address the full system so let's take a walk through some of this and we'll talk about it now let's go back to that very detailed page i was talking about this page so those imbalances to the biological systems lead to a couple of these issues right and now we are in deep mitochondrial dysfunction yes this page right there thanks but we're at the top there thank you Mitochondrial dysfunction and oxidative stress. You have question, Kim? No. Okay. Do we know what mitochondrial dysfunction is? And oxidative stress? Okay. It happens to all of us. It is the oxygenation of the mitochondria. So the mitochondria, what happens in the mitochondria cell? What is the mitochondria cell? We are, don't read, so the, the answer is not there. What is the mitochondria? Okay, it's the energy plant. It's the energy plant of the body. It's where the ATP is produced, which is the energy from the sun that came through the food and that's where it's converted to ATP. ATP is the energy molecule that powers the body. Is that clear? So the mitochondria, when you have a dysfunction, it's debilitating to all the systems. Because that all the systems need energy. Are we clear? Kim, you look kind of worried. No, 
I think I wish I showed you pictures of the mitochondria. Like so hold on, hold on. So we have a cell. Sorry, I know it was a biological class. So every cell, and then we have this thing called the mitochondria. That is in every cell. Inside the cell, nutrients have to get in here to power this engine. So all the nutrients come in, and this is the engine that powers it. I don't want to go into the biochemistry of how it produces ATP, adenosine triphosphate. This is the energy molecule, ATP. It's gas called it, for the body. Huh? It's gas. Yeah, it's gas. It's fuel for the body. So that fuels everything. So that's the mitochondria that produces that. It's like your generator. Right? And so if there is a dysfunction in the generator, what? No, it doesn't shut down. Because it's not all of them that die at the same time. Every cell has a mitochondria. So when the mitochondrial dysfunction begins, where do you think mitochondrial dysfunction will come from? Now I want you guys to think. I've been talking about it this morning. Where do you think? No, not really. Where does it come from? I'm talking about the dysfunction. I'm not talking about the optimization. No, it comes from epigenetics. So the cell, when it was dividing, did not have enough nutrients to build the right mitochondria. So it built a suboptimal mitochondria. This suboptimal mitochondria does not work as well as the brother that built it, or the mother. Because not enough nutrients. Do you get that? Yeah. That's really at the core of epigenetics. Mm -hmm. The copy that was made... It's are you not getting it? That's the real source of the dysfunction. It's not that the current one was dysfunctional. Yes, it could be, slightly, but the underlying long-term dysfunction comes from the copy. You know that most cells live about three to four months, but every cell in our body is, we have a new child seen every seven years. All the cells are re-changed, right? So that's why chronic illness takes a long time, right? Because when you are not eating the right things, doing the right things, right, across the lifestyle ingredients, over time, more and more of your cells are getting dysfunctional. And at the core of cancer is the levels of dysfunction begin to approach 30 to 40 percent. Those cells, huh? Yeah, critical mass, and then they become cancerous. Is that making sense? Because of their epigenetic copying. So now when they go to make a copy, or when they go to die, they lose control, which is where cancer really comes from, during before senescence begins, which is the cell death process, right? So aging comes from the right? Yeah. All right. So now let's look at the next one. Toxicity. Um, and so that, sorry, just a step back. That mitochondrial dysfunction is really escalated by oxidative stress. These free radicals in your body, that's why we love detox. And we're going to talk more about now. So the oxidative stress is what we call reactive oxygen species, ROS. These are elements that are produced out of normal production of ATP, right? So when we produce this energy, there are some outputs out of it. The byproducts of energy production are ROS, right? Reactive oxygen species. When your body is very healthy, those things are captured in the cell and excreted. So it goes out of your urine or your pee and your poo, right? But for some people, if that ability to combine with ROS is not happening for the excretion, which typically the organic acids would deal with that, then the ROS accumulates inside your body, causing what we call oxidative stress. 
it's like the rusting on iron right it's very bad for your body okay there's some details that you can look at it you can go google all this stuff and really get deep so now we are deep at the level of really what is causing a lot of the imbalances across the systems at the cellular level let's look at the next one toxicity and impaired detoxification where does detoxification happen I need for my class to know where do, does detoxification happen what's the key organ for detox no it's not the guy okay I, I like how you different answers are coming why is it not the liver what is the liver's function for filtering it's filtering and why is that filtering an important issue talk to me like what there's a very important thing that the liver does it recirculates the bile back into the liver that bile fluid you need to read it it's a very very important thing in the digestive process so it takes out the excretes but it recirculates that right it's important you check that out now let's go to the liver the liver is the workhouse for detoxing right and so we have paperwork here that shows us our overall detox process uh, we'll find it if you can find it Vincent uh, that shows the three stages of detoxification it is a, it is almost like a chemical deep chemical process because what it does is that it unbinds the toxins where they have been attached and it has to rebind it to things that are gonna help it either fat soluble or water soluble for excretion out of the body it's a very very it's like a chemical engine it's very very complicated that's why your liver being really highly functional is a very important aspect to health so people have what they call non-alcoholic fatty liver disease right and it is a real challenge when you have bad diet and bad nutrition and it impairs so that's what we call you have toxicity but you have an impaired detoxification system right because even if there we all have toxicity but if you have a good detox system it just cleans it out are, are you getting that yeah. that's why we recommend that you are taking the sulfur clear and the and the, the, the metallo clear and that every three to six months you actually do a three a ten day detox because the liver needs extra help because it's dealing with all this extra overload of cleaning our system plus we want to make sure your air quality your water quality your food quality is good so you reduce that toxic load you see that we are reducing toxicity but we are also helping the liver with the detoxification process do you see that? that that's how we are approaching this and that is very helpful because it reduces the inflammation load do you see how our intervention is working we're not just giving you some medication we really want to dampen these biological systems and bring them back into homostasis it's very important guys that we understand the underlying biological processes that are going on what is that okay let's look at then the genetic polymorphisms right which are predispositions right what is an example of a genetic polymorphism what's polymorphism i love this speaking victor victor you're going to sleep here man what is a polymorphism it's uh, the uh, genetic evolution of you, you, you're close it's a mutation right every time we make a copy we are make, creating a mutation right epigenetics is part of that overall mutation itself give it to them it's like this case was originally clear yeah but it's uh, it's a copy exactly right 
So I wanted you to look at the picture of the liver and see what happens when the liver, when we have impaired detoxification, right? Very important, it's a very important picture, guys. Very important picture. So let's go to the next one. So we're going to talk about a couple of polymorphisms here or mutations. The first one is the glutathione metabolism. What is the function of glutathione? So how many people take glutathione here? No. You don't take? No, I have a pet. <laughs> okay, well that's taking glutathione. Oh yeah, it's stimulating glutathione. So why is glutathione important, Jad? Uh, Vincent, what do we do with people who I find guilty in my class? We, we've created a room, an execution room. We do waterboarding in there and a lot of other things to bring you back into line. Okay, so glutathione is at the core of reducing oxidative stress and detoxification, right? Overall, helping the body bind to those reactive things and take them out of the body. Now let's go to the big one that is emerging as a very big issue, this whole issue of methylation, right? Those methyl groups, when I was doing chemistry, they were very, very great things. This chemical group, it's called a methyl group. It is really crazy. It's a free radical group. It does damage in our body. Free radical damage, right? So sometimes you want to quench it by attaching things to it, right? Glutathione helps with that, with getting rid of these free radicals, right? And so a lot of people who have methylation issues, it has to do with mostly the B vitamins that support our folate metabolism. And so people like me who have the MTHFR mutation, our ability to metabolize and manage folate is very challenged. So we supplement with the cobalamin, which is the methyl B12. And you also, Vincent, we we'll, we'll lose you, Victor. You take methyl B12, you take methyl B12, you take B... I do a B12 injection. Here or at a performance center? Yourself? Rancho. In Rancho. Okay. You know we're going to be running Rancho, right? I heard. Yeah. Yes. Welcome. Okay. <laughs> All right. So he's doing a B12 injections, which is really the best way to take B12 or to take it through IV because it's a very unstable, especially the metal, it's very unstable and it is really not digested very well. So it's really good to take it um, liposomal or through injections or through uh, uh, IVs. So methylation, we're gonna run a class on methylation. It's a really, really big topic and I don't have the time to go into it right now. And then let's look at allergies and autoimmunity. So the minute that um, the minute that you're inflamed, what tends to happen is that your body is now in overreaction because your body thinks that the attack is imminent at any time, right? So the body is in fight or fright, right? It's in fight mode. High alert. high alert. And when you're on high alert, the body overreacts to a lot of things. Stress. Yeah, right? And that really wears down a lot of the resources. So, things that perhaps you were not really allergic to, all of a sudden you're allergic to them. Because the body is now suspicious of all illegal immigrants into your gut. Right? It's looking, checking your paperwork. That's a fake passport. Go away. Right? It's being very, very harsh. That's what happens, right? When you're on full alert. You're double checking the paperwork. That's a photocopied passport. You are not allowed in. 
Where are you from? Nigeria. That's a shit hall. Go back. <laughs> right? And so autoimmunity is becoming a really, really big problem. A lot of people have autoimmune illness. And the issue is not really about autoimmunity. What, so what is the issue about? So I'll stay with me. The issue is about inflammation. Because once you dampen inflammation, the autoimmunity gets resolved through homostasis. You cannot fix autoimmunity. That because it's a response from the body. You can fix what is triggering the autoimmune response. Is that making sense, guys? You cannot go fix autoimmunity. If you try to do that, the body is going to be like, who is that? Right? Is that Mr. Trump? You think you can fix everything? Right? The body is going to respond inappropriately. So when you look at the pharmaceutical companies producing medications, that's why it doesn't work. You can't force the body to fix autoimmunity. Autoimmunity, because you know why? We don't even know what is running homeostasis. We don't know what is running these biological systems. Do you understand that? We don't. And until we understand that, we cannot build models on how we can direct the system to work. And so all we need to do is to go at a lower level and help the body with the things that it needs to fix itself. Then let's look at the digestive function. You know how much we spend time here on the digestive function. There are four big things in the digestive function. One is the bacterial balance, which we resolve with probiotics and prebiotics, right? Second is the gut integrity. That's what we're talking about, zonulin, the tight junctions. You want to make sure those the mucosal layer and the tight junctions are secure. That is why you really go for diets that are non-inflammatory, right? And we have things here to support that. What is number three and number four? Tell me, my staff. Yes, it's controlling inflammation and inflammation response, right? Yes. The insufficiency of what? So, getting our gut function working very well, it's a combination of things that we really need to look at. Our diet, the bacteria, the enzymes to support things, right? And making sure that everything is working well. And our body, with this really most important biological function, gives us a lot of signals. You're gassy, you have cramps, your poo is not coming out well, you're constipated. The body knows how to give you a lot of signals about this very important. And all of us every day have some level of dysfunction in that architecture. All of us every day. That's why you need to really pay attention. Are you properly hydrated? Did you take your digestines? Did you take your fiber? Did you, do you understand? It's almost religion. You have to go to church to fix your stomach because you have to follow the rules. You stay outside of the rules, you're going to cause a lot of problems, right? Are we, are we clear on this issue? Then we talk about the nutritional deficiencies, right? And there are two groups of nutritional deficiencies. There are macronutrients and micronutrients. So let me ask a big question. Could you survive only on micronutrients, Kim? No. Yes. Yeah, why do you say you could survive just on micronutrients? So first of all, hold on, hold on. What, no, hold on, yeah, yeah. What are micronutrients? Yeah, well, well, I want you to know what they are. They are vitamins and minerals. So now let's go back to the question. Can you survive only on vitamins and minerals? No. I didn't ask you. No, wait, wait. 
because we need to get the point. No, Hold on. Let me answer. Yeah, no, 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 I want. Some other said that we don't have the heat. We can just take nutrients if you live. Well, that is if you take my medic. I said nutrients. I didn't say just micronutrients. Okay, no, but I really want to address that issue. So, why did you think micronutrients were enough? Why do you think that? Is it because I said it, or because you thought about it? Yeah, okay, which ones do you need, the macronutrients? On the macronutrients? Yeah. <laughs> and what else? The protein. Okay, why do you need proteins? To build the muscles. The cells. Okay. Amino acids are at the core of mitosis and cell replication. You understand? So that's why we need macronutrients and micronutrients so that well, that's why I said nutrients are more important than calories okay it's very important that we understand these differences I'm making this important because if at the core we don't understand it then we cannot really take action so you can live only on supplements because our supplements have protein have fat and carbohydrates plus yeah so when you take something like um, bring the trolley bring the trolley when you take something like the glucose control it has all of those things inside right that's why most of us are using them as meal replacement right Prasad you are recommending some of it as meal replacement right so this one